Part 10, Beyond the Life Cycle, Chapter 31, Policy and its Lacunas. Every discussion of duty has two parts. One part deals with the question of the supreme good, the other with the rules that should guide our ordinary behavior. Kikoro, on Moral Duty. 31.1, The Experiential Policy Model. Why did our... Why did the system policies and rules that we have discussed emerge? In the spirit of William of Ockham, our best explanation is that just as experiences follow from policies, policies follow from experiences. This experiential policy model is simple and explains a lot, but puzzles remain. Policies divide nicely into those based on social and political consensus and established and implemented by law or social custom, and two, those created by the modes for their own purposes and embedded in moral practice. The first category is what most policy analysts think about when the word policy arises, but the second is important as well, but is more often in the domain of the management consultant. We talk about both here. Policies reshape experience and the process continues. We visualize this process in figure 31.1. As we have seen, the experience of one mode frames policy making for other subsequent modes. Understanding the transportation experience is the key to understanding policy and the life cycle of technologies. An operative word is learning. We have learned from the transportation experience and learning has yielded rules, guidelines, regulations that tell us how to create, deploy, and operate systems. We take those rules to be policies. We need to address where they originate, who enforces them, what is tacit and what is explicit, how well do they work, and how are they changed. The unfolding of the transportation experience organized our discussions. It told us how policy protocols are modeled on experience. We spent a good bit of time on railroads because they provide a mother logic that applies to other modes. But railroads are not the only mother logic. The maritime experience affected other modes as surely as the automobile highway system will affect future modes. Each mode has its own internal logic, as well as borrowed logics it has adopted from other modes. 31.2 Policy Models The introduction of this chapter gave a terse statement of the author's point of departure. Figure 31, the experiential policy model. The introduction of this chapter gave a terse statement of the author's point of departure. Figure 31.1, the experiential policy model. The transportation experience is embedded not only in geographic, economic, social, and political environments, it is also corralled by the limits of technological structure and the nature of specific modes. The nature of transportation and the greater environment, collated with the transportation experience, gives rise to perceptions, principles, and attitudes. Those beliefs generate a layer of policies, both government and private, that translate into actions. Action and reaction indicate that the modes adjust performance to cope with problems. Those actions shape and reshape the transportation experience. Our view is not conventional. Like the comparison of the life cycle model of the deployment and evolution of technologies and networks to the Newtonian model, the experiential model we propose can similarly be compared to conventional models operating in a more fixed environment. For instance, one modern version of classical rational policy analysis model is described in Patton and Sawicki, 1993. It suggests a very orderly process of six basic steps, defining the problem, establishing evaluation criteria, identifying alternative policies, evaluating alternative policies, displaying and distinguishing among policies, and monitoring policy outcomes. Rather than a rigid lockstep approach, the process involves feedback and iteration among the six activities. It is normative, describing what the policy analyst should do, but it is ahistorical and aspatial. It does not tell us where policies actually come from. It does not tell us what values are important to the players. It does not explain why choice sets are constrained, either artificially or economically. Other policy models are descriptive and tend to be politically oriented, with actors, variously elites, interest groups, organizations, bureaucracies, self-interested actors, who have some power attempting to pull strings and competing for legitimacy. Decisions are generally incremental, as it is difficult to make non-incremental changes. The experiential policy model says that perceptions, principles, and attitudes are forged from experience interacting with the nature of transportation systems. For example, principles bearing on the organization of systems as well as public and private sector roles, stem from experiences when systems were deployed. Policies relating transportation investment to economic development result from past development experiences. Our experiential policy model considers the formation of principles from the transportation experience 
as part of the system, or endogenous. It is subject to the objection that experiences other than transportation ones are bound to bear on transportation experiences and attitudes. That is a valid objection and must be true, yet we have a strong response to it. One aspect of the response is that the transportation experience has so permeated all social and economic experience that we should not think of purely outside transportation experiences. The deep and economy-wide impacts of the railroad experience on institutional forms, financing, government activities, regional economic organization, and so on, illustrate the impacts as well as the transfer of transportation experiences. As we point out elsewhere in the book, national industrial policies have roots in transportation experiences. The explicit recognition of embedded policies is another important way the experiential model differs from the conventional model. The experiential model explains the structure and performance characteristics of systems to which the policy is applied. The characteristics of systems create the need for policy studies and condition their results. The characteristics may be thought of as providing stages for daily and annual debates about regulatory funding, pricing, and investment legislation. 31.3, the subjects of policy. 31.3.1, the 1978 National Transportation Policy Study Commission. Another way to approach issues is to clarify them by their associations with inputs to systems, systems per se, or outputs from systems. Consider the list below from the National Transportation Policy Study Commission's 1978 Special Report Number 1. 1. Federal Economic Regulatory Reform. 2. Air Carrier Regulation. 3. Motor Carrier Entry. 4. Rail Abandonment. 5. Standard Highway Rules and Regulations. 6. Public versus Private Ownership of Transportation. 7. Proliferation of Government Agencies in Transportation. 8. Consolidation of Transportation Regulation Agencies. 9. Federal Transportation Planning Assistance. 10. Federal Subsidies. 11. Modal Intermodal Trust Funds. 12. Block Grants to State and Local Governments. 13. Maritime Trade Support. 14. Waterway User Charges. 15. Financing Urban Mass Transportation. 16. Maintenance, Repair, and Upgrading of Highway Facilities. 17. Transportation Industry Capital Formation. 18. Coal Slurry Pipelines. 19. Energy Conservation. 20. Transportation and the Environment. 21. Highway Accident Reduction. 22. Labor Management Relations. 23. Stimulation of Employment through Transportation Facility Construction. 24. Regional and Community Development through Transportation Policy. 25. Mobility Rights. About 10 of the items belong to the inputs and outputs classes, and the remaining issues deal with running or operations of the system. Many of the system operations issues bear on intergovernmental relations. Another group has to do with efficiency to be obtained through deregulation and or assurance of a level playing field for competition. Perhaps the only item from the 1978 list no longer relevant is coal slurry pipelines, though other pipelines are still problematic, while several others have been largely resolved for the time with deregulation, namely motor carrier entry and rail abandonment. Some items would be framed differently, but at the core remains the same issues. Everything else from this 1978 list is still a policy topic today. On review of this list and considering the many issues into which they divide, we note both narrow definitions and lack of attention to outputs. Issue 24 does have an output orientation, it refers to development, but by and large, the social and economic purposes that transportation serves are not stressed. It is implicit that making transportation efficient and controlling ills is all that is needed. Agreeing with Dupuy, 1844, who said, the ultimate aim of a means of communication must be to reduce not the costs of transport, but the costs of production. We think policy ought to pay more attention to outputs. His insight, stated conventionally that transportation is a derived demand, is too often lost in transportation debates. 31.3.2, the 2008 National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. The Who, Won't Get Fooled Again, 1971. Transportation policy issues in the new millennium, as defined by the 2008 U.S. National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission, a blue ribbon commission authorized by Congress, resemble those of decades earlier. Almost everything it says about the problems are correct. Where it fails is in solutions, which, while not necessarily wrong, are very much of a more of the same character and will not enable any kind of innovation. It asks, why is transportation important, and identifies five primary reasons. 1. Making goods more convenient and accessible. 2. Improving international competitiveness. 3. Developing markets within the United States. 4. Enhancing personal mobility use. 5. Determining the nation's energy use. 6. Impacting health and safety. Each of the subsequent chapters asks a question. 
What are the future demands on the surface transportation system? How does our system function today? What are the long-term capital investment needs of the system? What revenue sources are available for financing surface transportation improvements? Are program and institutional reforms instrumental to achieving our national vision? Better management, streamlining programs, improving focus, instituting pricing, and adequate funding are all necessary for the legacy surface transportation systems. And as short-term policy where everyone is resigned to living in and using a mature system, it is rational. However, the Commission built itself as transportation for tomorrow, and it is more about preserving the transportation of yesterday. In addition to there being no technological fixes for the problems identified, aside from mention of electronic toll collection, the report could have been written 30 years earlier with slightly different numbers. There is no thought given to institutional fixes affecting who delivers transportation services. 31.4. Interaction with the transportation experience. The statements in the lists above are general. How do they generate specific issues? We think the transportation experience interacts with general ideas to yield specific issues. How does that work? The experience yields policy part of figure 31.1 suggests a closed system moving along a trajectory. But the environment changes, and it is the transportation experience plus the changed environment that triggers issues. These become policy issues if the situation is in conflict with one or more of the items on the list. We should also recognize that government involvement in transportation is large and long-standing. Also, there has been feedback from transportation experience to the general function of governments. The transportation experience thus has affected governments and ideas of what governments should do in a rather broad fashion. The relation is not one way. Transportation has affected the development of government roles. Government roles have affected transportation. It is also worth noting that sometimes general policy applied to transport is taken to be transport policy, for instance, accounting rules or EPA rules. Also, we should keep in mind that the transport experience is not broadly known. Individuals know fragments of it, depending on how they are positioned within a mode. The recent experience is better than known than the historic experience. The longer experience extends to many of today's topics. Toll roads, defense, value capture, subsidy for maritime transportation, transportation and land use relations, deregulation, network rationalization, etc. However, since that experience is not widely known, it is sometimes ignored when framing policy. 31.5. Doing better. The many social programs created or expanded in the 1960s provided windows for the use of social science knowledge. What was known could be used to cure housing problems, fix education, solve urban problems, and do many other things. But for many reasons, not all of which were related to adequacy of knowledge, applications of the social sciences did not solve problems, and a considerable disenchantment set in. In 1970, social scientist, Nixon administration official, and future senator, Daniel Moynihan, presented a change of view. His notion of benign neglect became a working rule. As a result of perceived failures, researchers have drawn back from claiming values for applications. In addition, current published work gives short shrift to applications, and methodological contributions are emphasized. The 1960s rush to apply social science knowledge through policy didn't affect transportation very much. However, economics-based policy has long found an application window in transportation, and was not rejected in the 1970s. Work by researchers pressing for deregulation was well received and led to the transportation deregulation movement of the late 1970s and early 1980s. In Western Europe and elsewhere, though largely not in the United States, policy that recommended privatization of government transportation assets was implemented in the 1980s and 1990s. Today, congestion pricing represents an application of knowledge directly to policy. There is a long tradition of the study of government structure and behavior, in political science and law in particular. One result is that policy problems are thought to result from poor government structure, and their cure is to change its configuration. For example, it was felt that the regulation of the airlines was dysfunctional, and disbanding the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAB, was the result. A radical change in structure. The dysfunctional government structure view has much currency in Washington. Indeed, the curing of government structural dysfunctions is often a motive for national transportation policy studies. It is a motive for the reorganization that occurs frequently in agencies. The work of the Buchanan School has introduced economic reasoning into structural behavioral work. It employs the well-known free rider insight that economists use in discussing the structure of markets and market failures. In political situations, the rational individual would not exert effort toward an end desired by a large political group because that individual would share in the end, even if no personal action were taken. 
In a large group, the action of one individual is inconsequential. This reasoning helps explain why special interest groups are so powerful. The intensity concept used by political scientists is similar to the free rider notion, and political scientists emphasize how the geographic organization of political power in the United States aggravates the intensity problem. We note that the free rider analogy comes directly from transportation. 31.6. Beyond the Supreme Good We have just suggested some models used to guide policy thinking. Just prior, we discussed the purposes of policy. Why do we create and implement rules to control systems? If there are dysfunctions, something is wrong, and policies seek to manage or correct wrongs. Our brief remark on improving what systems do that is worth doing introduced another aspect of the purposes of policy. They seek improvements going beyond correcting wrongs. This section will not rehash those remarks. It seeks to emphasize the ways equity and efficiency issues are seen in the minds of beholders and the roles they play in debates. Imagine being at a conference table or a public meeting where policy is at issue. You wish to understand what is being said and why. What we have said thus far is helpful. People do come from a vision of what's wrong, and they apply their calculi of how things work to make suggestions. They work toward the supreme good. They also frame their suggestions or counter-suggestions to what others have said, in light of their fragment of the transportation experience. If they are working, say, on airport design in response to congestion, that experience frames their views of the air transportation system and of transportation in general. But it seems that there is something more, something beyond the supreme good suggested by Kikoro in the chapter's opening, and the influences of experience. Some rules are telling them exactly what to say. By and large, we would reject the implication that personal or institutional interest, greed, or something like that is shaping remarks. Rather, we think that they are making equity and efficiency trade-offs. See figure 31.2. Those trade-offs guide ordinary behavior. Horizontal equity has a spatial or among places content. Vertical equity has an interpersonal or among actors of different classes context. Efficiency at either micro or macro levels has to be traded off against equity of different types. Returning to our imaginary conference table or public hearing, we hear an owner-operator trucker demanding that policies be imposed to reduce the cost of short-term chassis rentals, or a small airport operator demanding facility investment subsidies. In our experience, greed isn't the reason for such demands, although at first glance it may seem to be. Rather, it is the rules about equity and efficiency. However, to be less Pollyannish, people may choose to emphasize the dimension of equity that aligns with their personal interests. 31.7. Discussion. Application of policy to highways. Turnpike and other early road experiences were building blocks for 20th century road program governance, construction, and financing. In addition to the transfer of railroad regulatory experiences, which were applied to the trucking industry, the railroad experience affected construction because railroad engineering was the training experience for many civil engineers. But while the railroads integrated rolling stock and track in the same organization, if in separate branches, the highway system differs. This has posed a great number of system difficulties. However, the disjoint control of trucks owned by trucking firms and pavements owned by governmental road agencies has created a number of extra costs that proper management of the system might avoid. Pavements are rated for different loads of trucks. Roads are restricted to 5 ton, 7 ton, 9 ton, and 10 ton axle weight. Look. Pavements are rated for different loads of trucks. Roads are restricted to 5 ton, 7 ton, 9 ton, and 10 ton axle weights. Shipments across this network are constrained by the lowest weight limit permitted on the roads to be used or risk violation, though weight enforcement off the interstate highways is very sparse. Some roads should be upgraded, some trucks should have more axles, but the disjoint nature of the control makes this coordination difficult. A major solution to these problems lies in rethinking highway finance. The ability to charge truckers different amounts for different roads would put the proper incentives for behavior back in the system. Economists have been arguing this for several decades. In the policy community, which has some working examples in the promise of modern revenue collection technologies, is finally absorbing it. A second solution to improve materials to the point that they are too cheap to meter, that is, so that they are sufficiently strong that it doesn't matter the load using them, within reason, is the analog to building your way out of congestion. Laying pavements with near-zero variable per-use cost may be technically possible, but their upfront fixed one-time costs are likely to be very high. The objective of this book was not to say that certain products, intermodalism, separate truck highways, a big dig, are the answer to problems. 
The discussion was to illustrate how system thinking offers ways to consider policy options. No discussion of how to proceed was stated. The policy question is, how do we forge policy so that the system behavior manages problems? That is, we wish the transportation system had capabilities to learn, reorganize, and renew themselves. They should be testing markets and changing the services they are able to deliver. They should be using technology as an instrument for change. They should have capability to react to problems in full ways. No large complex system has those capabilities in a high degree. We do not know if transportation systems as a class are worse or better than other complex systems. The disjoint nature of decision making by facility suppliers and system operators is one devil, as we have stressed over and over again. We think that the urban auto and truck highway systems are worst case transportation systems, closely followed by the air system. Within the urban highway system, we think that fixed facilities are the worst case component. They limit the options available. What must we do? First, we need to recognize that problems are rooted in structure and behavior. Second, we need to ask how structure and behavior might be changed. And third, we need policy supporting the actions needed to change structure and behavior. The question of how structure and behavior might be changed is answered in part by consideration of actions not taken when the systems are developed. Taking some of those actions are an option. Actions should be consistent with social trends, specialize the systems, and problem management, for example, sharp reductions in energy use, urban congestion, and environmental impacts. What kinds of policies are needed to support change? System histories answer the question. Policies should support innovative individuals and institutions exploring niche-specific markets. Policies should give priority to new combinations. The old will enter those combinations, for instance, the extensive right-of-way of the highway system. Lots of new technologies might enter, such as developments in electronics. Policy should recognize resource constraints and ecological realities. Policy should also recognize that successful transformations will track social and economic development trends. We think the four general statements just made should guide policy, but are well aware that most policymakers would want something more specific. Being somewhat more specific and paying attention to only the highway system, which is the main focus of transportation policy, one might suggest rethinking the scopes of federal, state, and local interest in the financing and provision of facilities. We think that exercise would result in a much reduced federal presence in the highway arena. However, there are other considerations. The second consideration is the federal interest in productivity increases and economic growth. That, as we see it, gives the federal government a role in efforts to improve services and the policies to support change just discussed. The third and final consideration is federal interest in health, safety, clean air. Again, we return to the policies to support change just listed. Hughes, 1989, has pointed out that mature systems suffocate nascent ones. Might the development path we are on suffocate the concepts presented here? As just remarked, many policymakers want specifics, and one way to generate suggestions is to think about markets. What about high-priority freight, small shipments of bulk freight, collector-distributor freight, passengers, and so on? One may think about existing or emerging technologies that might enter as building blocks in new endeavors. There is much more than new propulsion information and computer technology so often mentioned. For example, existing tunneling and pumping for air pressure reduction technologies suggest vehicles and tunnels moving in a partial vacuum. Applications might be found in a passenger and priority freight market. In addition to savings in tunnel excavation costs, vehicles act less like pistons and pumps, and this simplifies needs for crossover and ventilation tunnels. Energy savings from reduced air resistance would reduce the cost of high-speed services. But there are existing systems for which we have not been able to think of promising redesign schemes. For example, about the only way major energy use reductions can be achieved in petroleum pipelines are by reducing pumping pressure and or increasing the diameters of pipes, reducing turbulence. Higher energy prices might lead to such actions, but will not open a new pathway for development. To make a difference in transportation, one has to fiddle with system designs and market niches. All it takes is imagination. Exercising a little imagination, one can think of many system designs that build from what we have and meet social, physical, and other constraints. Applying the market niche constraint reduces that number. One might say that all that is missing is the will and energy to try some things out. But that is not the case, for one needs an overall environment that values innovation and rewards the required risks. The lack of such an environment is part of the problem. The lack of imagination is too, because while the policy world abounds in imaginative people, Imagining design changes in transportation requires stretching system designs.